Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Delighted to welcome my old friend Dino Marcantonio to the show. Dino is a practicing architect in New York where he's been doing so for 30 years. He's also taught at the Yale School of Architecture and the University of Notre Dame. And I came up with this rather provocative title for today's episode, Why Is Everything Ugly? But, Dino, I think it's a legitimate question. And I, it is. I, I, I want to, and it's something you have to struggle with as an architect. But in any case, it's been quite a while since we've spoken. Welcome to the, by, by the way, by the way, before you even, you, before you even accept my, my greeting and my welcome, <laughs> let me say that a few episodes ago, I had uh, an old college friend on who now is a Lutheran pastor and, and he was the perfect person for another episode. So this, the Tom Woods show is very, very quickly turning into This Is Your Life. I'm going back through <laughs> the people I've known, and I think, doggone it, they're all so smart, they should have their own episodes. Anyway, Dino, <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Tom. It's an honor to be here, and it's good to see you again after all this time. Yes, 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 indeed. It absolutely is. Okay, so let's talk about the problem of ugliness. And th- when we get to this problem of ugliness, we're going to talk a bit about modernism. And modernism in architecture is its own thing, but there's modernism in all different areas. There's modernism in theology. There's modernism in um, in the arts. There's modernism in, in music, which I guess is a subset of the arts. But one thing that I think they they seem, at least to this dumb layman, to share in common is a, a, a really a contempt for the uh, aesthetic sense of the average person. And and they seem to take a, a, a wicked pleasure in, uh, their, uh, in having a sense of superiority to these people. You're too stupid to appreciate what I've done here. You know, you're too stupid to appreciate my art. You're too dumb to appreciate my music that makes no sense or whatever. And I wonder, do you feel like there is a, is there a kind of arrogance, let's say, at the heart of some of the architecture that we see these days? Um, Am I overstating it? You can tell me. You know, we're all friends. You can tell uh, me. Uh, listen, I, I, I have, I think that the, the, the layman's reaction to architecture is, for the most part, absolutely accurate, and architects do not give it enough credit. Mm. They, um, I, I don't know if I would say that a majority of architects actually have ill will. I think there's a, <laughs> a funny comedy video out there about a guy who's playing an architect who actually wants you to hate him personally because he hates you personally. <laughs> most architects are not okay. actually doing that, to my knowledge. At least I have not come across them. I think that they're just trying their best to do what they think is what makes sense in the context. Right. Right. And, um, now there are, there are some who, who just sort of write off, uh, the layman's, uh, reaction to what is perceived to be ugliness. Um, if they believe that they are the professionals, just as a doctor is a professional and you're not going to ask a layman for medical advice, you ask a doctor for medical advice. So when it comes time to building a building, uh, the, the belief can be in some that uh, the architect is the professional and just, you know, trust your professional and he will give you something that that is good. And uh, if you don't see that yet, just trust him and maybe eventually you will. But but um, sorry, oh, go ahead. But what I was going to say is, but if I were to talk to him, yeah, I don't necessarily mean that they're all haughty and they're walking around motivated by hatred all day. But what I mean is if I were to strike up a conversation with an architect and say, you know what I really would love to see? is a, a revival of X. He, he would just put his head in his hand like, oh my gosh, what in the world? And again, maybe it's not a, maybe it's not hostility toward me. It could be more a matter of, this guy doesn't understand my field at all. He wants to take things that belong to a bygone era or to yeah. another geographical location and artificially yeah. transplant them where they don't belong. And, 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 and there's a part of me that can hear that. Um, no, I think that you're absolutely uh, right. Uh, I'll, a majority of them would think that you're a nostalgist and uh, you're misunderstanding and you just need a little bit of education. And uh, when, if you were in his position uh, with his education and dealing with the facts on the ground as he saw them, you would probably do the same thing. But um, I think that that architect is suffering himself from a misunderstanding. And that's why I do something and there are a small group of architects just like me who do something fundamentally uh, different. Um, 
but um, I think it's based on essentially uh, a misunderstanding of the nature of architecture, the nature of beauty. Uh, and I think that there are probably some deeper philosophical problems there as well. So these things have roots that go back, this problem has roots that go back hundreds of years. That is not fully appreciated, I think, by my profession. I was reading uh, today a little bit about this stuff, and I found apparently there was a survey done, I don't know how long ago, in Sweden among Swedish architects. And it turns out that the, the great majority of them themselves live in buildings that were constructed before 1930. And so the yeah. author of this article, himself an architect, says, so it almost seems as if modernism is something you do to other people. <laughs> you know, it's like the, the, well, the school teachers who send their own kids to private school. It's the same kind of principle. It, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't think that it's because there is um, a sadistic impulse there uh, <laughs> and not a corresponding masochism. Right. But uh, I, I think that basically what's happening there is when it comes to your private home, that is seen as uh, the domain of self-expression. And when it comes to buildings that populate the city that are not entirely private, like government buildings, culture buildings, office buildings, there your uh, personal self-expression is not appropriate. So if, if mm -hmm. traditional architecture, what the layman would call, what I would call beautiful architecture, is your self-expression, that is, that is okay. So that is why you... For the most part, architects who practice traditional looking architecture are doing work in high-end residential. That is still, that there's still a lot of work that's happening there. But um, when it comes to office buildings and stuff like that, then you're looking at a different, uh, different environment. But self-expression, I think, is basically what it comes down to. When, it, when you look at um, the, the nature of architecture, if you think of it as symbolic construction, and if you think of beauty as the visible expression of the invisible nature of a thing, um, then you start uh, getting into some uh, territory that is a problem for the modern mind. For two major reasons, I think. One is the modern mind is dominated basically by a kind of pragmatism and at the same time dominated by, I guess what I would call, and I apologize if I'm going to offend some uh, philosophers here, subjectivism, which is to say, if you want to uh, try to discuss or, or think about ideas that are above what can be measured by science, then you're getting into a subjective area. So when you're talking about public buildings, um, private self-expression is not the place for that. You're going to have to rely more on a pragmatic philosophy. And if there's any room for anything higher than that, when you start getting into meaning, questions of meaning, especially public meaning, then you're... I believe, and I could be wrong about this, the impulse is basically try to make as much space for as many people as possible to uh, put into the building their own um, subjective interpretation. And so you start to see what I would call abstract expressions. You see that in painting and, and in sculpture. You also see it in architecture. I hope that made sense. Yeah, oh no, it does, it does. But maybe instead of just dancing around it, I should just ask you to tell me your understanding of what modernism is. Because a modernist might well say uh, something like, uh, look, I understand the aesthetic sensibilities of people. You know, I, I can't satisfy everybody's, but what I can do is provide a uh, living space for a human population that is vastly larger than it was when the kind of architecture everybody claims they like was being built. I'm able to do that. I'm able to build because of modernist construction me methods. I can build higher. I can build in a way that's more dense. I can accommodate actual people. And it, it may, may not be the prettiest building in the world, but it's something, you know, so they could, they could say that kind of thing. Well, but what exactly, what exactly is this movement all about? Would you say? Well, let's, let's first, um, 
take a step back even from that in order to understand modernism because you want to understand what modernism was reacting to. So let's think about what is the nature of architecture. What is architecture? So imagine your favorite building. Let's imagine St. Peter's, some magnificent work of art on which there is general agreement that it is, it is very good. It is a good work of architecture. So St. Peter's, the Hagia Sophia, the Pantheon, the Parthenon, take your pick. And compare that to a very perfunctory construction like a warehouse building. This is an example that I like to use. When you look at a warehouse building, all it's basically doing is keeping the weather out in order to be able to store things. So it just serves a purely uh, pragmatic function. Whereas a building like St. Peter's is doing more than just keeping the rain out and keeping the weather out so that people can go inside and attend services. It is speaking to you on a symbolic level. You look at the facade of St. Peter's and there's all kinds of sculpture there. There's magnificent uh, sculptures representative of columns that seem to be supporting what's called a pediment, which looks like a roof, um, all at the very symbolic level. These are not literal structures that are, that are shown. They're all symbolic, whereas the warehouse has none of that. Um, and then you could look at, uh, you could divide uh, the kinds of symbols that architecture employs into five categories. So at the most basic level, uh, architecture organizes things. For example, when you walk into St. Peter's, you see the important things on the center, most importantly, the altar with the famous Baldacchino by Bernini. Uh, you walk into the Hagia Sophia and it would have been the same thing. Um, you walk into St. Mark's in Venice. You walk in and there's the altar. So that the altar, because it is in the middle, it is the most important thing. And then the less important things are on the periphery. Whereas if you go out to a warehouse, that's not necessarily the case. They may be housing a priceless work of art, but it really doesn't matter where it is, as long as it's high and dry. Uh, there, there will be some number that tells you where it is when you're trying to locate it. But its actual location in the organization is not symbolically important. Okay, so organization, I think, is the first way that architecture expresses um, the inner, the hidden nature of the thing that, or the institution that is, that is being housed. The second level would be uh, geometry. So if you think again at, about St. Peter's, you see most spectacularly its dome. So the dome is a completely unnecessary geometry. Uh, why did they build it? Well, they wanted to symbolize heaven. Okay, the, the dome symbolizes the sky. And there's other ways in which it is expressive geometrically. It's got in plan, it's shaped in a cruciform way. And also the sides relate to one another uh, in ways that are easily expressed using whole numbers in order to symbolize the unity of the whole. The warehouse, on the other hand, does not have any special geometries that symbolize anything. And whether one side is longer than another side really doesn't matter by how much. Again, it's just serving a purely practical function. The third way architecture symbolizes is through symbolic structure. So if you can imagine in your mind's eye, uh, St. Peter's uh, or any building of importance pretty much that was built before the 20th century, you will see on it what look like columns on the facade. They're not actual columns. They don't literally support the roof. They're just representational of columns. And they're not ordinary columns either. They look like they are alive. If you look at the columns on the facade of St. Peter's, they look like bouquets that have, uh, or, or bunches of flowers that have been lashed together at top and bottom. And they're miraculously supporting beams that also seem to have sprung to life with leaves and flowers and eggs and all kinds and tongues and all kinds of uh, forms that suggest that the, the, the structure is alive. Okay. The fourth way that I think architecture expresses the hidden nature of uh, an institution that it's housing 
is what I call graduation, which is to say the more important the building or the part of the building, the more expensive the materials will be, the more expensive the kind of construction will be, the more permanent the construction will be, the scale will be more monumental. So we, if, if you can uh, imagine in your mind's eye all the buildings of your favorite city, like Paris or Rome, and you just arrange them in a line, you will, uh, from most important to least important, you will see that they are graduated in the sense that the most monumental is going to be on the left side. The most important buildings will be the most monumental, the most expensive, the most luxurious materials. And at the other end of the spectrum, you're going to have the least permanent materials, the least expensive materials, the lowest scale in terms of monumentality. And then finally, uh, architecture expresses the hidden nature of the institution, its housing, through types. And types is most easily explained if you think of how a city is divided into um, its, rel its respective institutions. And in each of its institutions is represented by a classification of building. That sounds very high five pollutant. All I mean is you have church buildings, you have townhouse buildings, you have courthouse buildings, libraries, theaters. These are classifications and they have a certain appearance that they all have in common. And so you can look at a church and you will recognize it to be a church and nobody needs to tell you that it's a church. So the, because you have a certain degree of cultural familiarity, you know what to expect when you come across a church and you are able to look a building, at a building and say, that looks like a church to me or that does not look like a church to me. And if you see a building that looks like a church and it's housing a parking garage, you will find that to be inappropriate because the type is not expressing accurately the nature of the institution that's within. So um, this was pretty much the way I think architects and people in general thought architecture's job uh, was until the Enlightenment period, essentially in the 18th century, when um, we started losing faith in the idea that well, we could have ideas higher than what could be measured, higher than what was pragmatic. So as pragmatism starts to take hold, uh, now this has a good side. I mean, we start making factories and we start uh, creating things very cheaply and we can feed a lot of people. Um, the corresponding architectural idea for that is form follows function. The idea being uh, how... How do I justify the forms that I'm looking at on a building? Or if I'm designing, how do I justify forms? So if I have a pragmatic mindset, it seems to me that the more honest way of building a building is to show off its pragmatic aspects. Uh, at the same time, you want to deal with the higher ideas. And, um, but because those get privatized through idealism, um, you, you get into abstract expressionism being combined with that. So today, uh, let's go back a step. At the, in the late 19th century, uh, when pragmatism had taken hold, essentially they had for, lost sight of why they were making buildings look like they had always looked. And the ornament was seen as superfluous to the purpose of the building. If we're building an office building, why should I be putting columns on it that have leaves? What's with all these ornaments? That is not functional. Um, so because they couldn't explain this to themselves, they suddenly stopped doing it. And they looked rather to the machine for a source of their symbolism. So this is the, the machine and also industrial processes. So this is why you get, for example, Mies van der Rohe's Seagram's building on Park Avenue, famous uh, monument to modernism, which rather than showing columns with leaves and all kinds of uh, uh, life 
uh, suggesting forms, you just have I-beams stuck on the outside because the I-beam was this wonderful symbol of progress and industrial capacity and production. Um, so there, there was just a search for meaning, essentially. And um, so I think that that is fundamentally the impulse behind modernism. Now, the layman looks at that and thinks, well, uh, gosh, uh, I don't know if that is a faithful representation of the nature of the institution. When I think of human flourishing, I think of more than just the number of widgets I can produce or the cost-benefit analysis. It seems that we just sort of have a natural intuition that we're meant for more important things than that and higher things than that. But um, so that does not really compute for uh, modernist mind. They have difficulty putting that together. If there is um, space being made for those kinds of aspirations, there you would see the industrial forms and the industrial uh, connotations mixed with a kind of expressionism. So you'll see Frank Gehry's uh, Disney uh, Concert Hall, for example, which is all um, stainless steel, very high tech, but it's a very free form, very expressive facade, which I think the intent was to leave a space for the viewer to have some kind of aspiration beyond the industrial process. But that's about as much as the modernist, I think, is able to offer. At least that's all that we've seen so far. Anyways, that was, I hope that was not too long-winded. No, 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 not at all. No, that's very important. Time for a quick message from our sponsor, Cheeky Maiden Soap. Now, if you could break into my house, which I strongly discourage, by the way, you would find Cheeky Maiden Soap products in my bathroom. And I've been using them for at least several years now. Now, why is that? Well, natural soaps like the ones Cheeky Maiden makes are typically made with organic ingredients like plant oils, essential oils, and herbs. So you're avoiding synthetic chemicals and potential irritants found in industrial soaps. In fact, just try to pronounce half the ingredients in those industrial soaps. You sure that's how you want to treat your skin? And here are a few, by the way. Now, I think in grabbing a few of them just now, I think I grabbed the most effeminate-sounding ones, but I promise if you need to have soap that's in more of a lumberjack style, they can fix you up with that also. So I got some chai latte soap right here, lavender soap. I'm not ashamed to tell you I enjoy that one also. Energizing soap, who couldn't use some of that? Their soaps contain nourishing ingredients that help hydrate and moisturize my skin. They leave it feeling soft and smooth. And natural soaps are often milder and gentler on the skin compared to their industrial counterparts. They don't strip away your skin's natural oils or cause dryness or irritation. Well, it's easier than ever to be like Woods because, because you know me, you now get a discount. Go to CheekyMaidenSoap.com and use code WOODS15 at checkout to save 15% off your next order. That's CheekyMaidenSoap.com and use code WOODS15 to take 15% off your next order. So w where does this leave us? To, where does this leave architects today? Now, most architects are not sitting around talking about the philosophy of architecture. Um, and, and I suspect, as with most professions, they uh, go about their work in, in a relatively mundane way. But I know that you, being a person of ideas, are thinking about this kind of thing all the time. So what makes your approach then to designing a building different from, let's say, that of most of your peers? And what's the source of the difference? Well, I, I mean, I am looking for... Uh, I am approaching architecture from the from a traditional perspective, which is to say, if if I am trying to design a building that belongs to a certain type, I'm trying to uh, build a house. I'm trying to build a church. I want it to look like uh, a church. I want it to look like a house. This doesn't mean that I'm following some kind of a formula. What it means is that I am working with the expectations that people are bringing to the situation. It reminds me of, um, I think it was Thomas Eliot, uh, T.S. Eliot, who um, said that all works of art form like a coherent body, all related to one another, 
And when a new work of art comes along, the entire body shifts slightly, all the pieces in relation to one another, and it creates a new whole. So that's the intent that I bring uh, to the work. And um, while it's true that um, architects are not thinking of this consciously, uh, it, things are happening at an unconscious level. Um, the market is simply demanding that it happen uh, in some respects. I think in the 1960s and 70s, you'd be very hard pressed to find an architect who could do or was willing to do traditional work. Today is a whole different world. If you want to find an architect who could do traditional work, they are out there. And uh, so tremendous amount of progress in the revival of traditional architecture has been made in the past 50 years. I recall, didn't you do a design for um, what, what was presumably what was going to replace the Twin Towers? Didn't you submit something for that? Uh, no, I did not participate in that, but a number of traditional architects uh, did participate in that. What I did do after 9-11 was uh, submit a memorial for the Pentagon. Oh, is that and, what it was? Uh, okay. Yeah, and that got some favorable press in the Wall Street Journal, thanks to Kate Spilly, who was a great advocate. Um, and there was, there was a nice display that was put on. Unfortunately, my submission was not selected, but uh, the fact that it got any attention at all, I was grateful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's what I was thinking of. Progress. That's what I was thinking of. That's okay. So now, so uh, now I want to try to think about the the how how do we somehow uh, because I can I can I can understand. I'm I'm trying to be fair here. I can understand somebody who says um, there's something wrong with. Uh, to, you know, let, let's say let's say you walk down down uh, the streets of Vienna and you're just struck. I, I mean, e- even some of the most mundane buildings seem like more impressive than anything you see in your hometown, and you're, it's just a delight of the senses. And then let's say let's say your hometown is Beijing, and you say I want Beijing to look exactly like Vienna. We all know there's something wrong with that. Like that shouldn't be. I want Beijing to feel like Beijing, even Correct. though Vienna is objectively beautiful. So there is something about architecture that has to, in some way, be giving artistic voice to a culture, I suppose, at the same time. Oh, yes. No, no, absolutely. So there's, there's two things working at the same time. here. So when I went through the five levels, the five ways in which architecture can express symbolic. Four of those I would describe as natural, and in that sense, they are universal. So when you're talking about organization, it is pretty much universally recognized that the center is more important than the not center or the edge, the periphery. So if you if you have a building or an object in a building that's important, you put it in the center. That could be in the center of an axis, that could be in your line of sight, Whatever, or you, if you're just locating a building, you um, you you locate it in an important site, which would occupy, you know, sort of an it would be sort of a uh, an ideal center uh, if the context were a city. If you're talking about uh, geometry, geometry is also universal. Everybody uh, knows what a circle is. Everybody knows what a triangle is. Everybody knows what a square is. Everybody knows what the ratio one to two is. Two to three. Three to four. These kinds of proportions, you find them absolutely universally throughout history without exception in any culture whatsoever. Beijing to to the Washington, D.C. Also, this idea of symbolic structure, the idea that uh, structure is represented symbolically, it's not literal, and that it's ensouled or um, given life with leaves and petals. You see that from Beijing to Washington, D.C., You see it everywhere, Um, except in the most primitive uh, of cultures where that that, uh, idea has not developed yet. And uh, the same thing with graduation, the idea that greater monumentality applies to uh, um, more important institutions. Now, when it comes to building types, there you you require some kind of cultural literacy. Uh, And because the people in Beijing are aware of their history, 
they are going to break some expectations uh, to whatever new building comes along. And so it has to feel, a new building must feel as if it belongs to Beijing. It has to get into the conversation that pre-exists that building. If you want to think of all the uh, previous works of art as engaged in a dialogue, a massive conversation, you have to enter that conversation. So you don't walk into Beijing suddenly speaking German with an Austrian accent. You go in there speaking Chinese, speaking Mandarin, I suppose. Well, then let's think about somebody who... Um doesn't like modern church architecture and says, I only wish I could have a church that uh, might have been built in 1745 or something. I, I wonder if an architect today might view that as me saying, I want Vienna to be in Beijing, because that's a matter of a geographical location, but that's not in, in theory all that different from wanting to push something forward in time and saying, I, I want... Uh, I want this temporal thing. I want, I want mid-18th century architecture in my, in my church building today. Maybe that would also seem like, well, for, for one thing, at some point we have to be original. We, we can't just keep building 18th century churches over and over again. And likewise, we can't build the, the kind of colonial buildings in colonial Boston over and over and over and over again. And at some point it has to evolve a little but then I think the, uh, the response to that might be, when I look around at modernist architecture, it doesn't look like an organic evolution. It looks like a bunch of people got together and decided this is what they were going to build and this is the rest of us had to just take it. <laughs> well, uh, I, you are absolutely correct that the art must uh, evolve. That is, you want to say new things. You don't just uh, quote the past. Now, the funny thing is, a lot of times when these revivals occur, they begin ostensibly as a pure revival. Think of the Gothic revival of the 19th century. But as you are reviving, unconsciously you are editing. You just don't realize that you're doing it. So while there was a Gothic revival, there is no mistake whatsoever. A 19th century Gothic revival building from a medieval building. Mm. They are miles apart, even though the 19th century architect was doing his darndest to, you know, build as the medievals did. Um, he was editing unconsciously, so taking out the parts that he didn't like and keeping the parts that he did like. And then, of course, there are the means at your disposal in the time in which you live. So when you're in the 19th century, you've got 19th century technology at your disposal. Um, uh, the labor conditions are going to be different. All kinds of things are different, and these are naturally going to have their effect. Um, so even if you're trying your hardest not to do a, uh, trying your hardest to, to do a, a complete reproduction, you're actually probably not going to get it. It's going to look like a, a work of architecture from your time period. In a hundred years, people will see the kind of things that people in the mid or early 21st century liked. And, uh, that will be obvious. Um, but I think that we need to do a little bit better than that. We, we do need to do more than just try to uh, revive. What we, what we do, I think, uh, or the best approach is to look at history like a laboratory. And you see it, all the buildings in, in, the, um, in the laboratory as experiments. And they were uh, trying new things, testing effects. And um, some of the experiments were not successful and some of them were successful. And so you adopt the ones that were, the parts that were successful. So this is the natural editing process. And you hope to do new experiments that are, that turn out to be successful. So the, the best architects among us will be very successful with their experiments. Michelangelo's architecture, for example, was the architecture of a, of a genius, uh, or Bernini or Borromini. These, these were guys who looked at the laboratory of the history of architecture, and then they, they were really pushing the boundaries, and they showed how uh, the rules that were suggested by the laboratory could be rewritten in a more complex way. Hey, it's your old friend Woods with a quick word from our sponsor, Blinkist. You and I have more books than we can possibly read, and no sooner have we finished one of them than we've bought two more. Now, don't pretend that's not true, dear friend. I know my listeners 
better than I know myself. A great way to cope with it all is to use the Blinkist app. With Blinkist, you can absorb huge amounts of information, the kind that satisfies your natural curiosity, as well as the kind that will help you be more successful in business and in life. We're talking 27 nonfiction categories. Blinkist condenses each book into 15-minute summaries you can read or listen to. For some books, you'll say, I definitely want to read the whole thing. For others, you'll say, this was more than enough. If you have a 30-minute commute each way, you can be absorbing the key ideas of four books a day. You think that might make you a more informed, impressive, and well-rounded person? You'll find libertarian classics even by Murray Rothbard, Milton Friedman, and even a book perhaps even by your host here, Old Woods. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account you get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Well, you seem to be, um, I don't know, maybe a little more sympathetic to, to some of your uh, colleagues whose outlooks are, are different from your own. Uh, but I can't help sharing a comment from a professor. I think he's in the UT system, University of Texas, maybe San Antonio. His name is Nikos uh, Salingaros. He's a... Oh, uh, I know. I, I've met Nikos, yes. Okay. I know his work. Okay, yeah. well, here's, this is, a, this is um, he, coi- he and a, a colleague of his coined a term, architectural myopia. And he says that he coined this term to describe, and these are his words, um, the curious and alarming phenomenon whereby someone who has gone through architecture school can look at a horrid, inhuman structure and declare it to be great architecture. Such persons literally cannot see what is right in front of them. The corollary is also frightening. Those same people look at older historical and vernacular structures and totally miss their intense degree of embedded life and humanity. To such people, old means useless, shameful, and marked for elimination. Is he <laughs> is he overstating the case or what? Well, um, it is surprising what happens uh in architecture school, I suppose you could say. Okay. Uh, didn't happen to you, though. Was, it didn't happen to me. I was a rebel. Um, I was. I gave my professors a very hard time. I um, kind of feel a little bit bad about that in my old age. Uh, but um, again, it comes back to that, I, I think. I, I, I try my best to be sympathetic to those with whom I disagree and uh, try to understand how they got to where they are, assuming that it, it doesn't come from a place of ill will. They're just trying their best. And uh, basically, at root, there's, there's simply, I think, a, a philosophical problem that has deep roots. It doesn't mean that we have to become philosophers uh, in order to solve the problem. I do actually think that uh, the theory will follow eventually. But it's going to take some time. And uh, I think that uh, the most effective way to midwife the birth of the theory or the mainstreaming of the theory, because in, in many respects it exists already, is to encourage the market for this kind of architecture. So it's, I, uh, I, I don't want to sound too cynical here, but universities do have as a priority placing their students in the workforce. And if there's a, a strong market for traditional architecture, they will find the theory to teach students traditional architecture that gets them placed in the workforce. You already see that happening in some institutions. Um, I hope to see more of it, and I think that we will. All right. See, obviously, Dino, you and I having our regular Sunday lunch together, uh, having been discontinued so many years ago because I moved away, has, has caused you to become a far more pleasant and agreeable person, you know? But, <laughs> <laughs> we, Tom, you, you're, you're one of the most agreeable people I know. Oh, that's very kind of you. That's very kind of you. But I want to go after these SOBs. I mean, these cities are ugly. Or not <laughs> cities, but these buildings. Like, you, you, know, you go to all these European cities, you know where everybody wants to visit. 
and you know where they don't want to visit. You know where they want to live. You know where they don't want to live. I mean, they and well, and, uh, well, like we all agree on this, and yet we still get rotten architecture all the time. Well, That's how I, I feel. I, I would go after the architecture. I would definitely go after the work. So uh, one area where I uh, I feel we're being a little too sympathetic is in the world of preservation. Uh, you will have some buildings that are just so offensive. Offensive in the sense of not just causing a visceral response in people, but just when thinking about beauty and how the purpose of a building is to represent the hidden nature of the institution that is housing. These buildings are just such a lie. They're just such a misrepresentation of the nature of their institutions that it's just wrong to preserve them. But there's a strong uh, element a strong current in uh, the preservation world that uh, says, yeah, I'm all for preserving 18th century beautiful stuff, 17th century beautiful stuff, but I'm also in favor of preserving stuff built in the 1950s. If it was a monument and, it, and if it's important, I'm in favor of preserving it. And to that, I say, you know, just take a bunch of photographs and document it so that the academics in the future can study it. But gosh darn it, it Really is ugly. And right, so we right, just, right. Well, you know, the thing we is, we just is, don't course, need to keep that. Well, of course, the preservation uh, movement uh, is is very much intertwined with local governments because the local government will designate something uh, to, to be a monument that can't be touched. But if you didn't have that, I think what would happen is if you build something that's truly beautiful in a way that moves people, they will make sure it gets preserved. You know, whereas if you well, build something hideous, it may pass. And that's the, that is the judgment of mankind on it. Well, let's not forget the origin of the preservation movement, which was the demolition of Penn Station in New York City. An absolute monument, a really beautiful building, one of the masterpieces of the firm McKinmead and White. And because that building was torn down to everybody's shock, and despite protests, uh, the preservation movement was born. I did not know that origin story. Yeah, so the, the preservation movement had to be created so that we would not destroy <laughs> buildings. So we can thank the preservation movement for the fact that we still got Grand Central. Mm. You know, we've got that big MedLife tower behind it now. They would have demolished uh, Grand Central soon after uh, Penn Station was demolished. Um, but it's thanks to the preservation movement and, of course, Jackie Onassis, who at the time was a great advocate for the preservation movement, that, uh, that we still have Grand Central and other monuments around today. Now, it's gone a little bit on steroids. I think that they need to uh, sort of uh, dial in their, their purpose here. Uh, I don't think that we should be preserving buildings which do not enhance uh, the beauty of our cities. Let me ask you one more thing. I, I want to get hostile Dino Marcantonio to come out, okay? I, and I think I... The demon inside me, Tom? I think I have put my finger on exactly the topic that'll do it. And that is modern church architecture, particularly in the Catholic church. Now, I'm yeah. sorry, you are not going to persuade me that this is just a disagreement that we're having on non-ideological grounds. This is just a matter of you know, architectural diversity. Absolutely, you can try all day long <laughs> to convince me of that, Dino. There is an ideological campaign behind these hideous churches. I'm so, you know, I mean, remember what you were telling me about a warehouse? Okay, these look like warehouses and they're not supposed to. So what do you think is going on? Do, are you really going to try to give me a benign explanation for the hideous <laughs> churches that we got? Um... I, I, I am. No, you are not. No, you are not. You are expelled from the Tom Woods show. <laughs> well, what I mean, so what happens is the the church, the Roman Catholic Church in particular. I won't I won't speak to other churches. I'm I'm familiar with uh, the the working somewhat of uh, the Roman Catholic Church. They're trying their best to reach out to people, and so when they want to build a monument. They, um, they want to speak a language that people understand, I suppose. Uh, they want to be, they, they, um, they want to be uh, seen as engaged. 
And so they will naturally look to the profession. It's, it's very similar to a person requiring legal advice or medical advice. They're just going to go to the profession. And the profession is going to respond to them overwhelmingly. You've got to do a modern church. Oh, okay, okay. Stop, stop right there. Stop right there. So you, I, I see what's happening. You're going to exonerate <laughs> the architect saying he's simply carrying out what the establishment of, of the institution wants him to do. Is that, is that going to be your line of argument? No, 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 no. I'm not exonerating the architect. All I, 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 by the way, the I'm, almost exonerating. Willing, I'm almost willing to exonerate the architect. He is doing what the yeah. SOBs want him to do. But what but my I'll, point is, they have sick architectural ideas, Dino. No, but I, have, I, I am thinking particularly, for example, of John Paul II, when he wanted to build the Church of the Millennium at Rome. Oh. Uh, the person who won the competition was Richard Meyer. And he ended up building a church that just looks like a typical Richard Meyer construction. Naturally, if you hire Richard Meyer, you're <laughs> going to get a Richard Meyer building. Yeah. So why did they hire Richard Meyer? I think there's really only one reason. Richard Meyer is a famous architect. He was at the height of his fame uh, in the early 20th century. And um, would, would the Vatican have hired a traditional architect that the world did not know or was not familiar with? It would be. It would be um, seen as an unusual move, I would say, from a pastor dare I say, from a pastoral perspective. No, I, I cannot accept this because there's no. <laughs> could you imagine if you transported Pope St. Pius X into the year 2000? He would say, "I will take the most obscure guy in in you know who's laboring in the field before I will hire this." this monstrosity. And yes, you know what? It will be an unusual move, but that's what I do as Pope. I do a lot of unusual things. And you know what? This commission might elevate this traditional architect to the level where he belongs. That would be the well, right answer. You you may have a point about Pius X, but you know, um, the church was hiring modernist architects right from the beginning, right from the 1920s and 30s. So before the Second Vatican Council, um, and they, they were, I think that the motivation was very simple. It was not, um, it was not too complicated. It, it simply was, they, they wanted to be modern. They wanted to speak with a modern voice. I don't, I don't know that, that, that there's anything more than that. Now, I do not doubt that there may have been a few who had m more sophisticated motivations who thought to themselves, I am interested in moving theology in a certain direction. And the architectural cognate of that is the following. Yes, the architectural cognate. Now, that's a very good expression. For example, yeah. if I were to go out to the cathedral that uh, Roger Cardinal Mahoney presided over in the, yes. I guess, 1990s. Yeah. Uh, it's just barren. And then it's, and, I mean, it, is it barren just by accident? We accidentally made it barren. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we we really want to encourage popular piety, but we just by mistake we made the thing barren. <laughs> it's pretty hope sapping. That is true. Um, <laughs> hope sapping is uh, another good term. I I don't know if Roger Mahoney was going for hope sapping. Uh, I think at the time he he just wanted to hire a famous architect, and he wanted to be respected. He wanted to do something that would be respected by the profession. Um, now, I, I, it's Roger Mahoney's theology is outside of my area of expertise, so I won't go into that on your show. If you come to New York and we go for drinks, we will go into that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that, uh, let's say, if, if we wanted to put a, uh, a charitable uh, interpretation on what was happening, I think that that's the way to look at it. Now, I, I will say that I have certain ideas, theological ideas, again, outside my area of expertise, that do have a cognate architecturally. And if you don't like the theological ar I ideas, it does make sense for you not to like that architecture. That is, it's cognate. So um, in that respect, when people see traditional architecture, uh, coincidentally uh, commissioned by orders and uh, clerics who have a more traditional mindset, um, that is coherent. Well, um, I, 
all I want to do is sit here and denounce people like the old days, Dean. <laughs> I apologize, Tom. <laughs> uh, dare I say I mellowed? <laughs> Looks that way, but 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 your knowledge of of and love for what you do um, comes through in everything you say about it, and and um, so I want to leave on this note. Suppose there's somebody out there. Um, you know, who wants to, you know, who has a project in mind. Maybe it's a house, but maybe it's a building that serves some other uh, purpose. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe the architects he's talked to just seem uninspired or are, are mm. going to produce the same kind of building he can see millions of copies of as he drives down the street. But he'd like something with a little bit more tradition and flair to it. Maybe he wants a Dino Marcantonio building. Where should he turn? He should turn to Dino Marcantonio. Just Google me. Yeah. Okay. okay good. <laughs> good. 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 All right. Yeah. Dino Marcantonio. Just the way it sounds. <laughs> and it's right here in the description of the video too. You can find it right there. And on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2416. You can find it there. Good old Dino Marcantonio. But, but yes, I mean, I'm sure you, you accept commissions. Of course. I mean, yep, what else I do you do as an do architect? That's right. I do mainly high-end residential work and uh, ecclesiastical work as well. Mm. But uh, I, I'm, uh, I've done all kinds of building types over my career. So as long as it's traditional, if you're looking for some kind of a shard that's shooting out of a facade, I'm not your man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But you can find a lot of people like that, um, you know, probably within 100 yards of where you're sitting. But, <laughs> but if you Correct. want the real deal... Dino Mark and you, you know what? I should talk to you, but we got to talk a little bit after we, we, we finish here. But thank you very much, Dino. Uh, I, I get to New York maybe four times a year. I really should, uh, we should have lunch. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Or Tom. dinner with Thanks drinks, because it sounds to me like that's a more interesting conversation. That would give us, that would give me more time and it would give you more time to find my, uh, my, uh, my buttons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks again. I appreciate it, Dino. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.